Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're now beginning a new series for the months of April, May, and June of 2017. This particular series is entitled Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter, and this particular, the first lesson is on the person of Peter. What do we know about him, about his background, and so forth like this? What does the New Testament tell us about him, and so forth? That'll be the focus of this lesson. I'm going to make a brief apology here. For some reason, our large TV behind me is not working at the moment. So uh, you'll be able to see it's fine, except you'll not be able to see the TV directly behind me. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we think back about 2,000 years now to your friend Peter and the challenges that he grew up with and his character and his boisterousness and his forwardness and then what he learned from his time he spent with you and subsequently through the Holy Spirit, may we gain some insights that will help us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we jump into studying the books of First and Second Peter, which will be our goal for this three-month period, we will take this lesson to discuss what we know about Peter himself. We know a lot about Peter because he was very ambitious and forward and repeatedly spoke up, often on behalf of all the disciples. After denying Jesus at his trial, you remember, he was one of the first ones to race to see the empty tomb. Peter was one of the three disciples, along with James and John, often named as the closest associates of Jesus. There are many references to Peter in the Gospels, as well as in the book of Acts. One of his shortcomings, we'll look at later, is detailed in Galatians 2. It's pretty clear from the story of Peter that he was quick to make mistakes, but fortunately, he was quick to ask for forgiveness and move forward in faith and humility. When do we first meet Peter in the Gospels? Well, chronologically, the first mention of Peter in the Gospels is found in John 1, 35 to 2, 2. And I'm going to read just a couple of those verses. You remember that Jesus goes down to the Jordan River. He asked to be baptized by John the Baptist, and John didn't want to do that. He says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. But Jesus said, no, let this happen. And he was baptized, and as he came up, the Holy Spirit came down on him, and the Father proclaimed him, this is my beloved Son. And then Jesus disappeared into the wilderness for 40 days for that time of fasting and prayer and temptations at the end of it. And then he came back to the Jordan River, and at that time, uh, we're going to read something about what happens. Um, the two disciples heard him say this and went with Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him. This is after John the Baptist has said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus said to those two disciples, What are you looking for? They answered, Where do you live, Rabbi? And of course the word Rabbi in, in Aramaic or in Hebrew means teacher. Come and see, he answered. It was then about four o'clock in the afternoon. So they went with him and saw where he lived and spent the rest of that day with him. One of them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah. I want you to think about the implications of that for a Jew living in those days. This word means Christ. The, the word Messiah would be from the, he, from the Aramaic or Hebrew. The word Christ is Greek. It means the same thing, the anointed one. Then he took Simon to Jesus. So this would be Simon Peter's first introduction to Jesus. He was called by his brother Andrew on great ex with, in great excitement because Andrew felt that he had found the Messiah. Now we have some, in, uh, some additional information about that. Dennis, you want to read it to us there on the uh, following the desiring, day? Desiring Desire of Ages or? On the following day, or you should be, I believe. Okay. On the following day, while two disciples were standing near, John the Baptist again saw Jesus among the people. Again the face of the prophet was lighted up with glory from the unseen as he cried, Behold, the Lamb of God. The words thrilled the hearts of John's disciples. They did not fully understand them, 
what meant the name that John had given him, the Lamb of God. John himself had not explained it. Leaving John, they went to seek Jesus. One of the two was Andrew, the brother of Simon. The other was John the Evangelist. These were Christ's first disciples. Moved by an irresistible impulse, they followed Jesus. Anxious to speak with him, yet awed and silent, lost in the overwhelming significance of the thought, is this the Messiah? Desire of Ages 138. Andrew sought to impart the joy that filled his heart. God, going in search of his brother, Simon Peter, he cried, we have found the Messiah. Another quote from Ellen White, page 139 and Desire of Ages. So try to let, uh, we would like to challenge you out there and we'll do, we'll try to do the same thing here. Try to imagine what kind of an experience this would be. The, the children of Israel have been waiting for the coming of the Messiah for 400 years since the last prophet said anything. Remember Malachi said, he's going to come, the, the, someone like the, when the spirit and power of Elijah is going to come before him. They had seen what John the Baptist had done. John the Baptist had been preaching and the whole nation had tried to go out to hear John the Baptist preach. And now John the Baptist himself says, Behold the Lamb of God. What does that mean? And so these disciples went, went after him and there they were with just unbelievable. I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know how even to think of words that would describe their excitement. We have found the Messiah. Well, one of Peter's closest associates in the Gospels and later in the book of Acts was a young man named John. What do we know about John? Carrie, can you help us with that? John was the son of Zebedee, probably the youngest son, for except in Luke through Acts, he is mentioned after his brother James. Luke gives the order Peter, John, and James, probably because in the early days of the church, John was closely associated with Peter. That John's mother's name was Salome in an inference from Mark 16.1, and Matthew 27, 56, for the third woman who is said to have accompanied the two Marys to the tomb is designated Salome by Mark and the mother of Zebedee's children by Matthew. Salome is usually regarded as the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, because in John 19, 25, four women are said, said to have stood near the cross. The two Marys mentioned in Mark and Matthew, the mother of Jesus and his mother's sister. If this identification is correct, John was a cousin of Jesus on his mother's side. Wow. And that comes from the New Bible Dictionary, third edition, page 592. Okay, now here's a challenge for all of you. <clears throat> we know that John, the Baptist, was a cousin of Jesus. Through what side of his family? Mary. His mother's. His mother's side. Mm -hmm. If the two disciples, John the, di the disciple and James his brother, were cousins of Jesus on his mother's side, does that make them also cousins of John the Baptist? Depends upon how close you define cousin. If in the strict sense, uh, we really don't know, do we? We don't. But we can, we can think that it may have been. Yeah, that's a possibility. Well, this is what Ellen White says about that relationship uh, in Desire of Ages. Again, Gordon, can you read that for us? Sure. This is from, uh, actually, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2. That one? Yeah. He, that is Jesus, had been separated from his mother for quite a length of time. During this period, he had been baptized by John and had endured the temptations in the wilderness. Rumors had reached Mary concerning her son and his sufferings. John, one of the new disciples, had searched for Christ and had found him in his humiliation, emaciated and bearing the marks of great physical and mental distress. <clears throat> Jesus, unwilling that John should witness his humiliation, had gently yet firmly dismissed him from his presence. So this is in the wilderness. Yeah. He wished to be alone. No human eye must behold his agony. 
No human heart be called out in sympathy for his with his distress. Can we hold it for just a second there? Yeah. Now this is something that is not found in Scripture. This is from Ellen White. But try to imagine this. If John was a disciple of John the Baptist, who might have been his cousin, and now Jesus comes down to be baptized, his other cousin. Now we, uh, we know specifically that John the Baptist and Jesus had not had any contact with each other, so there, would, there couldn't be anyone making some ideas of, well, this is a, some kind of a setup arrangement between the two. So they hadn't. But apparently these other, other cousins, however they were related, we don't know, uh, had, they had been, John at least, and, and probably Peter and, and, and Andrew had been disciples of John the Baptist first. Because there, there they were, they were down there at, at the time of the, the follow-up to the baptism. So now, Jesus comes back from the wilderness. Well, he, he's out there in the wilderness. John, who's a cousin, who knew he came down there, is wondering, what happened to him? Where'd he go? I mean, you can, you can see where that, that might be the case. And so he goes looking for him. Now, and apparently found him. And it found him, apparently, according to Ellen White. Um, it's interesting to note that, and I, if we had a lot of time and all my pictures here, I could show you, uh, there's a monastery up right on the side of the mountain. You have to, like, go almost straight up to get to it, that they claim to be the place where Jesus was tempted. Uh, I don't know that that's really true, but um, there, the, the mountainside from Jericho going up, from which, of course, is right beside the Jordan, going up there and across to the high Judean plateau, about where Jerusalem is, is, is pretty steep. So, okay, you want to read us the rest of it there, Gordon? Another paragraph. The disciple John had sought Mary in her home and related to her the incidents of this meeting with Jesus, as well as the events, the event of his baptism, when the voice of God was heard in acknowledgement of his son, and the prophet John had pointed to Christ, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, I'm going to ask you all to scratch your heads for me a moment. Thinking back, try to forget everything you know about the later ministry of Jesus. And here's, Jesus comes, a young man, healthy, strong, it's your cousin. And you hear someone say, Behold the Lamb of God. What would you think? What would you? It would catch your attention, to say the least. Yeah, what, what would that mean? You'd think he's wrong. I know who this is. Yeah? Well, that's a, a certain possibility. But even the expression, what, would you, what do you think the expression would mean to them? Well, the sacrificial system, uh, especially, I mean, mm -hmm. you could think of any lamb or sheep out in the wilderness following a shepherd, mm -hmm. but uh, probably the lamb that was sacrificed would have hit them uh, uh, as the more significant one, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and so what happened to those sacrificial lambs? They were slaughtered. They were slaughtered. Well, that, of course, couldn't happen to the Messiah. No way, right? They held that out till the end. Yeah. Well, do you think um, John knew what he was talking about, or did the Spirit come over and he just said it? I think the Spirit came over him and he just said it. <clears throat> I don't think he had an idea what, what that meant. Because um, I, I keep thinking about the time he sent his disciples over yeah. and said, are you the ones we ought to be looking for? And um, he probably had his idea of what should be happening, too. But it wasn't exactly working out. Yeah. So. Well, and, and yeah. And we could talk more about that. But basically, I mean, all of the Jews were sure that when the Messiah came, he was going to remove, I mean, chase out all their enemies or destroy their enemies, conquer the Romans, whatever it took. And he was going to make their nation as powerful, at least as powerful as it was in the days of David. That's what, they, that's what they were looking for. On the other hand, um, the Jews were very familiar with the book of Isaiah. Yeah. And the only mention of the Lamb 
in the book of Isaiah is in Isaiah 53, yes. which is the lamb that is taken to the butcher. And who are the butchers? Yeah. We are. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think, how many of you think might have even thought of that passage from Isaiah 53? We don't know, of course. Yeah, but on the other hand, where does the New Testament talk about a relationship between the death of Christ and the sacrificial lamb? It's not there. Yeah. yeah. But the other one is there, because when uh, the eunuch Ethiopian mm -hmm. uh, is trying to figure out the answer to that question, where is he pointed? Pointing Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Yeah. Well, we don't have time to spend a, a lot of time going through the chronology of the ministry of Jesus, but from the time he was baptized to the first Passover, he, he did a number of things. Let me just run through some of that. Evidence suggests that the baptism of Jesus occurred at least one and a half years before the story recorded in Luke 5, 1 to 11, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, which is the calling of the disciples. The, which, calling the calling of the, of the first four disciples. Yeah. And who were those first four disciples? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Okay? And remember, well, we're going to talk about it in a moment, the, the story with the fishing and so forth like this. During that time, during that one and a half years, Jesus had traveled back to Galilee after his baptism and visited the wedding feast, remember that in John 2, turned many gallons of water into pure grape juice, John 2, 1 to 11. He moved his main center of operations from Nazareth to Capernaum, and his mother apparently moved at the same time, John 2, 12. Later, he returned to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, cleansed the temple for the first time, John 2, 13 to 25, and had that discussion with Nicodemus that we read about in John 3. That was followed by a full year of ministry in Judea, sometimes with some of the early disciples and sometimes alone. Then there was a second Passover described, or part of it's described in John 5. During one trip through Samaria, we don't know which, at what point in that year and a half this happened, he spoke with a woman at the well at Sychar in John 4, 1 to 42. Later he healed the nobleman's son, and it seems like that may have happened just after the trip, after the visit to Sychar and Samaria. About the time of that second Passover visit, when Jesus was rejected and threatened by the Sanhedrin, John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod Agrippa. Then Jesus' full-time ministry in Judea was finished. He moved his area of ministry to Galilee. So, here's what happens. Jesus is baptized. We're not sure what happened in those first six months except for the Galilee experience, the, the Cana wedding and a couple things like that that I've mentioned. Then there's a year when Jesus, we know almost nothing about the experience of Jesus, just those few mentions a few things mentioned there in John 2, 3, and 4. And then at, in, in John 5, the second Passover, the, 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 particularly the Pharisees were determined, after he, the miracles Jesus had performed, determined to kill him. And Jesus says, okay, the time has come for me to leave. He's been working sort of what we'd call under the radar in Judea. But now with the dangers and the troubles that are going on there. Um, he says, it's time for me to leave. And about the same time that John the Baptist was arrested in, by, by Herod Agrippa, Jesus left Judea and focused his, his ministry in Galilee. And what we read in the first chapters of Mark, Matthew, and Luke are his ministry for the next year in Galilee. They, they do not mention the ministry in Judea at all, three, the three synoptic Gospels, only mentioned in the Gospel of John. If someone wants to see this outlined, we have it on the Theox website under yeah. the Gospels. And it's also from the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, around page yeah. 120 or so. Yeah. Somewhere in there, the chronology of the Gospels. Actually, it's a little bit further. It's 200. Uh, it's maybe. closer to 200. Yeah. yeah, if you want to look at it. There are some differences of opinion about a few of those events, but the SD Bible Commentary has done a very careful uh, search um, and, and done a good job. And what you find on our website is a, a slight modification 
to that with some for some reasons that you can notice there. But it's interesting. We are such creatures of, of time and and everything's got to be done in order and so forth in our modern setting that I think it's helpful for us to look at these biblical stories in that way because sometimes it make a big difference to know whether this happened before or after something else. So we're now going to come to the time when Jesus has moved his, his ministry to Galilee. He's established himself in Capernaum and he goes out for that first uh, uh, trip. We're going to mention this now in Luke 5. One day Jesus was standing on the shore of Lake Gennesaret. That's the same, that's Lake Galilee. While the people pushed their way up to him to listen to the word of God. He saw two boats pulled up on the beach. The fishermen had left them and were washing the nets. Jesus got into one of the boats. It belonged to Simon. So who's Simon? Peter. 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 Simon Peter. So those are his, both his names. And asked him to push off a little from the shore. Jesus sat in the boat and taught the crowd. When the, he finished speaking, he said to Simon, push the boat out a little further to the deep water and you and your partners let down your nets for a catch. Now, Simon said the obvious thing. Master, Simon answered, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, I, before we go on with the story, I want you to think about this. What's happening here? Here's a carpenter who's never fished, as far as we know, a day in his life, telling a bunch of fishermen who've been fishing all their lives <laughs> with these big heavy nets that are perfectly visible in the clear waters of the Sea of Galilee. And he says, push out. They've been, they've been fishing all night because in, in the night, of course, the, the nets wouldn't be visible. Push out from the shore just a little ways. We don't have to go along. We don't have to clear out there in the middle of the lake. Just push out a little ways. Let down your visible nets into the, into the water. And what's going to happen? You fill up. Mm -hmm. They were, well, so now we need, to, we need to look at the background. There was a group of professional fishermen who had spent their lives on the Sea of Galilee. They were very discouraged because they had recently heard of the imprisonment of John the Baptist. I mean, you know, think about there. They think, okay, Jesus is going to be the Messiah. He's the one that's going to set us free from the Roman yoke. And here's his forerunner. And the forerunner, I mean, he ought to be part of the parliament, right? Or part, at least maybe the cabinet, you know? And now what's happened? He's in prison. I mean, how, the story's not working out right. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they went temporarily back to their fishing. They had caught nothing all night long. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think God intentionally prevented them from catching anything that night? Probably so. Mm -hmm. Okay. To well, make them discouraged, God wants people to be discouraged. No, well, He's setting up the <laughs> the miracle here. <laughs> setting up the miracle. Okay. We do not know. We do not know how much time Peter and the other early disciples had spent with Jesus during his one and a half years when Jesus was primarily working in Judea. Now, if you read Desire of Ages from Ellen White, she talks about times when Jesus was alone. She talks about times when the disciples were with Jesus. So we just don't know how much of either one. We don't know. But uh, how do you suppose those future disciples felt about having a carpenter tell them as a professional fisherman when and how to fish? Well, now let's see. Who's Gary? Are you? I'm, no, it's not Gary. Uh, Jim, are you? I can read uh, discourse. discourse. Yeah. Jesus turned to Peter and bade him launch out into the sea and let them, let them, excuse me, let down his net for a draught. Peter was disheartened. All night he had taken nothing. During the lonely hours he had thought of the fate of John the Baptist, who was languishing alone in his dungeon. He had thought of the prospect before Jesus and his followers, of the ill success of the mission to Judea and the malice of the priests and rabbis. Even his own occupation had failed him, and he was watched by the empty, as he watched by the empty nets, the future he had seemed darkened with discouragement. Master, he said, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Desire of Ages 425. 245, I'm sorry. 
try to imagine yourself in the shoes of Peter. Now, if we're trying to get to know Peter in this lesson, we need to try to put ourselves in his shoes. When were Peter and his friends about to give up following Jesus and return to fishing? Is that why they were out fishing? Did this miracle help to encourage them that it would be safe to become followers of Jesus? Did they have even the remotest idea that Jesus would be crucified and almost all of them would end up being martyrs? <laughs> what? Talk about crazy things. What if you, someone just sat down right then and said, guess what? This is what's going to happen to Jesus and this is what's going to happen to you. They didn't even know that until Jesus went to Jerusalem there at the end and they still c couldn't believe it. Still it didn't make sense it. to them. If they had known at that time, they would have left him. Yeah. Because they didn't have the background to understand what was really going on at the cross. Yeah. And even at the end, Jesus said, uh, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. So there's yeah. a uh, sequence to Revelation. Well, Jesus had spent a significant amount of time, we don't know how long, sitting in that boat, preaching to the crowds. He's beginning his ministry in Galilee. Okay. These are probably mostly people from Capernaum itself. He's probably just a short distance north of Capernaum. There's some nice beaches there. Um, so that probably is where that happened. Did anything he said during that sermon encourage them? Maybe. Well, try to imagine Jesus coming to your place of employment and telling you to drop everything and follow him. I guess we need to finish our story before we get to that point, don't we? Let's go back to John, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 5, finish the story. We got down to verse uh, 6. They let their nets down and caught such a large number of fish that the nets were about to break. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full of fish that the boats were about to to sink. Now these are boats, but these are the same boats that the entire, that Jesus, Jesus slept in one of those boats while all 12 of the disciples were trying to row the boat. So this is a boat that's big enough to handle a significant number of people. This is not a, you know, a three, a three burst person uh, rowboat or something. This is a pretty good sized boat. So they came and filled both boats so full of fish that the boats are about to sink. When Simon Peter saw what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Why would Peter say that? He realized his inadequacy. Because of what? What Christ had done. He was a fisherman by trade. He had responsibilities and he, as he said, worked. And here's this relative newcomer told them what to do and nearly sunk the boats as you said. <laughs> Quite yeah. a difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and remember he's, he's worried about John the Baptist mm -hmm. down there in prison. Yes. But he could, he could see that this was a divine intervention. Yeah. This was not something, <laughs> oh this happened last <laughs> year. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, like, we'll do it no, again tomorrow, never, right? Never. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, think about this now because Peter was married. He had a family. He was supporting his mother-in-law. We sort of assume, based on that, that maybe his wife's father was already passed away. Uh, and Jesus says, follow me. I'll teach you how to be fishers of men. And they dropped everything. Are we prepared to follow Jesus like that? Well, right after you get a boatload of fish, you don't really worry about anything else if you could do that. <laughs> so I don't think <laughs> I don't think it was as hard at that moment as you think. Yeah. So the equivalent today might be a, a big sale of something that's property or a big commission or something. Well, they didn't even worry about the fish, did they? They just uh, took their, off. Their partners might have. So yeah, was, uh, give it to them. Probably Jane, John and James's father was with them because he often worked with them. So he probably made a great haul that day. Well, um, just carrying on with our stories of Peter now. Jesus spent a year 
And obviously, there are many, many events recorded from that year which we don't have time to, to talk about. At the end of that year, what happened? Do you remember? At the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus tried to get away from the crowds because by this time, crowds were following him from Decapolis, from Tyre, from Sidon, from even from Syria, and from way down in, in, in the, the, the countries down south. People from all over were flocking there to get healed and to hear the gospel. So it was really difficult for Jesus to have any private time at all. And he tried to escape on the boat, and the people, but the people followed him along the, along, the, along the shore, and they could see the boat. Oh yeah, there he is, there he is, there he is, you know. But he, apparently he and the disciples had a few minutes to spend alone, not much. And then they began to crowd around him. And at the end of that day, what happened? Feeding the 5,000. He fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So probably 15,000 at least, maybe 20,000 people with, with what? Five loaves and two fishes. Five loaves and two fishes. Incredible. So now the disciples seen all those fish come up, mm -hmm. and now he's seen him feed all these people. I, I don't know if it would be too hard to follow him right then. Yeah, well, he had already, they had already been following him for a year. Yeah, but so they never discouraged him the first time. Yeah, it right. It was all taken care of. Now they were swinging the other way because they tried to make him king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they said, this is our moment, you know. Everybody's, and these people are all gathered. They're getting ready to go down to the Passover. And so, you know, what were they thinking? Crown and king. Take this man, if necessary, by force. Take him to Jerusalem and crown him king. And what did Jesus have to say about that? He dismissed them and got in the boat. He said, well, not quite that fast. Well, well that's right. He told the disciples. He told his disciples they had to get in the boat. He said, you get in that boat. And they, he said it with such authority that they couldn't argue with him. They were very unhappy about it, but they got in the boat and started off. Then what happened to the crowds? He dispersed them. He dismissed the crowds. And what did he do next? Went up to pray. Yep, went up to the top of the mountain to pray. And then what happened? Came walking on the water at night. When was that? Between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. So Jesus has been praying probably all the night up to that point in time. The Bible doesn't say specifically, but he often did that. And so now he comes walking on the water. And what happened? Peter was amazed. Well, they were all, at first, what happened, they were <laughs> they all... They thought it was a ghost. Yeah. yeah. They were scared. And then when they realized it was Jesus, what did Peter say? Can I come out? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this looks like fun. If you can do that, why can't I? Yeah, right, exactly. I, every time I think about this story, I have to think. I have a very close friend who, many years ago, back in the 40s, was... Uh, was attending, was going to the University of Chicago, which is not too far from uh, Notre Dame University, the big Catholic university in there in Indiana. And he went over to visit the library over there one day, came in the main front entrance, and there's a big shallow pool in front of, it was at least in those days, in front of the, um, the main entrance to the Notre Dame University. And someone put up a little sign out in the water that says, please don't walk on the water. <laughs> I always have to think about that when I, when I re think about this story. So, and what happened to Peter when he started out across the water? At first he could walk <coughs> on the water and... Well, at first he's looking at Jesus, yeah. Ellen White says, and as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, what, was what happened? He walked. He walked fine. So then he says, boy, guys, look at me, you know. And then what happened? <laughs> he started to sink, right? So Jesus had to reach out and rescue him again. And as soon as they got in the boat, they had been trying all night to row a short distance across to Capernaum. As soon as they got in the boat, the boat was in. It was at Capernaum, just like that. How do you suppose you, that happened? Are you happened? suggesting another miracle? I am. So how do, you, how do you get that short of time from the text? Oh, it, it says that. Um, 
Yes, immediately they were at the destination. Immediately they were at the destination. They tried to row so hard all night to reach. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's so, there. Uh, yeah. Well, then what happened the next morning? Do you remember the story? The people came flocking there and they said, okay, Jesus, do it again. Right? I mean, if, if we can just follow this guy around, listen to his fabulous stories, he'll feed us three meals a day maybe. I mean, why should we go through these difficult lives we have and work so hard to get a little bit of sustenance and so forth? Like, we just follow this guy around and he feeds us miracle food. And what did Jesus say to them? Do you remember? He said, you didn't, follow me because, I mean, you didn't follow me because you really wanted to hear what I have to say. You followed me because... The loaves and fishes. Because of the loaves and fishes. Then just, Jesus did something quite surprising. While the crowds were headed for Jerusalem for the Passover, where did Jesus go? He took his disciples. For the next six months, he stayed out almost completely away from either Galilee or Judea. He traveled to uh, Tyre and Sidon area. He healed that woman's daughter, the Canaanite woman's daughter. And then they, they traveled across and went up to way up north to uh, Caesarea Philippi, where there were a lot of pagan temples in those days. And a number of those pagan temples, are, at least parts of them, are still there. And here they are, surrounded by these pagan temples. And what did Jesus ask them? Remember? Who do you think I am? Who do people say that I am? First of all, who do people say that I am? And what was their response? Well, they mentioned maybe you're that prophet referring to the one that Moses talked about. Some thought maybe Jeremiah. Some thought Elijah. That was a very common idea. And then Jesus said very pointedly, who do you say I am? And what did Peter respond? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commended him and saying what? This truth has been revealed to you directly by my Father in heaven, right? How do you think that happened? Peter has been off and on with Jesus for two and a half years now. There's no chance that he learned this some other way. Did he have to have a direct revelation from God to... I think he just saw or heard the words of Jesus and the message he had that was so unique, mm -hmm. so unlike anything that the priests or the philosophers might have brought mm -hmm. before the people that he recognized something different about him and no one but God could have brought such a, me such a message to the world. Okay. You know, I, think, I think though that the um, Holy Spirit has a, a a knack for helping people put things together in their heads. Sure. I mean, that's what happens when you read the Bible. Yeah. If the Spirit's helping you, he, he, he helps you put things together. And that's okay. probably what happened to Peter. He just remembered all the things that were happening, what he was hoping for, and everything, and voila. But you have to is. be willing, because there were others who saw the same things and, and did not. Okay come to those same but conclusions, but they, the will, mm -hmm. so the will it still comes back to the will. Right, exactly. But, let's be careful here. Let's, let's remember they knew nothing about what's going to happen after that. They had no idea what we know about the story of Jesus. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, what did he have in mind? You know, Sooner or later, we're going to get you down to Jerusalem, and what's going to happen? You got to be king, yep. right? So how does how does Jesus respond? Get thee behind me, Satan. Well, and what what did he say to them before he Jesus said that? He said he would have to go down to Jerusalem, and the disciples said they're brightening up. I'm sure. Okay, yeah, let's go to Jerusalem. But he said, I will be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law and end up being put to death and three days later coming back to life. And they're, huh? 
I'm sure they had, could not imagine what in the world he was talking about. So Peter says, no, that can't possibly happen to you. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Was he really talking to Peter? He was certainly talking to the voice of temptation. Well, I don't know. How. That would be a good way to tell a person that they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? <laughs> yeah, and that would make an impression on them too. Well, but now let's be honest. We, we in this class, we have tried to suggest that there's the great controversy involves more than just what's going here on planet Earth, right? what's going on here on planet Earth. So who was, in effect, standing behind Peter? Satan. Satan. So he wasn't speaking just to Peter. He was speaking to Satan, who was standing behind Peter, and he was saying, go away. You can't do that. Well, don't you think Peter was just responding to his understanding? Sure. Um... So, but he was completely wrong in what he had, yeah, what he no, thought. That's why I said it would be a good way to tell him that he was completely <laughs> wrong. Yeah, right. But to this day, we lack understanding. And to this day, we all represent Satan to a certain extent as well. And this is where we need to progress. Well, Ellen White puts it in these words. This is Desire of Ages 415. The disciples still expected Christ to reign as a temporal prince. Although he had so long concealed his design, they can't figure out why he's... I mean, why don't you just get on with it, right? They believed that he would not always remain in poverty and obscurity. The time was near when he would establish his kingdom. That the hatred of the priests and rab rabbis would never be overcome. That Christ would be rejected by his own nation, condemned as a deceiver, and crucified as a malefactor. Such a thought the disciples had never entertained. And we know if you go on, there are, uh, if you can read Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9, and then Luke 18, there appear to be at least four times that are recorded. We don't know how many other times there were, but there are at least four times that are recorded when Jesus specifically said to them, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be, and each time he said a little bit more. See, and that last time, Luke 18, let's just read that real quick. Uh, they're on their way from Jericho up to Jerusalem. It was a huge crowd, and that crowd is just buzzing because they think they're going to crown Jesus king when they get up there. And here's what Luke wrote about that. Luke uh, 18, starting with verse 31, Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we're going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. And the disciples say, Hooray! Think about it! It's going to happen! Finally! He, and then Jesus says he will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. And then this incredible verse, But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Now that's a terrible warning for us. It's a warning for us about what? Ignorance. Well, even more than ignorance. And fashioning our own expectations. If we have, if we have our minds so set on something that we basically can't accept any other alternatives from that, then we're setting ourselves up to do what the disciples did. Well, I hope we're not doing that with our expectations of the last days. Well, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> I mean, each one of us here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each church member, each... Well... What a radical change of yeah. uh, mindset they had to undergo to, mm -hmm. to recognize that this was the way he was going to be the Messiah and not an earthly figure of some yeah. sort. So they were thinking that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom, overthrow the Romans, and have all the things that we know are happening in the second and third coming happen right then. Is that right? Yeah. The, well, they didn't know. They, they knew something about the second and third well, coming from Zechariah. Yeah. Not nearly as much as we know about that. Uh, but they, they believed that Jesus was going to come in power 
and the many of the Jews actually believed that Jesus, that the Messiah was going to show up on a white horse and the head of armies, and he was just going to chase out the Romans, and that hadn't happened. Well, now we come to the upper room. Remember, we're, we're, we're learning about Peter here. And what happened in the upper room? Uh, the Peter denied, well, Peter said, you know, Jesus said to them, all of you are going to abandon me tonight. And Peter says, what? No. Even if everyone leaves you, I won't. In fact, I would die with you. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. yeah. And what happened a little while later? He denied him. He denied him. First of all, he slept through most of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, uh, here's what Ellen White says about what happened immediately after that. It's, uh, uh, the first thing, remember, Peter tried to cut off that guy's ear. Well, he didn't really try to cut off the guy's ear. What was he trying to do? Someone he was trying to cut off his neck. <laughs> his but chest. the guy, I'm sure the guy ducked like this. And so all Peter got was his ear and Jesus fixed his ear. And then what did the disciples all do? They ran. But after deserting their master in the garden, and now I'm reading from Ellen White again, two of the disciples had ventured to follow at a distance the mob that had Jesus in charge. These disciples were Peter and John. The priests recognized John as a well-known disciple of Jesus and admitted him to the hall, hoping that as he witnessed the humiliation of his leader, he would scorn the idea of such one being the Son of God. John spoke in favor of Peter and gained an entrance for him also. The disciple, now, we have no idea how, why they knew John and they didn't know Peter. There are people who've suggested, scholars who've suggested that since John and his family were f good fishermen, maybe they occasionally took fish from Galilee all the way down and sold them in Jerusalem. That's a little hard for me to swallow because, I mean, even by horseback, it's quite a journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, what condition would the, would the fish be in by then? But anyway, somehow or other they knew John. The disciple John, upon entering the judgment hall, did not try to conceal the fact that he was a follower of Jesus. He did not mingle with the rough company who were reviling his master. He was not questioned, for he did not assume a false character, and thus lay himself liable to suspicion. He sought a retired corner secure from the notice of the mob, but as near Jesus as it was possible for him to be. Here he could see and hear all that took place at the trial of his Lord. Ellen White tells us that if Peter had been faithful in prayer instead of sleeping in Gethsemane, he would not have denied his Lord. Desire of Ages 7.14. I'm sorry, would one of you be willing to read the next paragraph for me, next two or three paragraphs there? <clears throat> I'll do it. You want to do it? Go oh, ahead. Yeah. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused, memory was active. Peter called to mind his promise of a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to prison and to death. He remembered his grief when the Savior told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord thrice the same night. Peter had just declared that he knew not Jesus, but he now realized with bitter grief how well his Lord knew him, and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown even to himself. Okay, let's take a break there for a second. Try to imagine yourself as Peter right then. Turn him inside out, pretty much. I mean, you know, he looks up, He's all of a sudden starting to remember, he looks up and there's Jesus looking straight at him. And then he remembers everything. You know, what would, what would you do? What would you say? Especially that he had been warned that this would happen. Had he not been warned, maybe... Yeah. 
<laughs> Dennis, you want to read the next paragraph or two there? Okay. A tide of me memories rushed over him. The Savior's tender mercy, his kindness and long-suffering, his gentleness and patience towards his erring disciples. All was remembered. He recalled the caution. Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may shift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Luke 22, 31, and 32. He refl reflected with horror upon his own ingratitude, his falsehood, his perjury. Once more he looked at his master and saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. Unable longer to endure the scene, he rushed brokenhearted from the hall. He pressed on in solitude and darkness. He knew not and cared not whither. At last he found himself in Gethsemane. The scene of a few hours before came vividly to his mind. The suffering face of his Lord, stained with blood, sweat, and convulsed with anguish, rose before him. He remembered in bitter remorse that Jesus had wept and agonized in prayer alone while those who should have united with him in that trying hour were sleeping. He remembered his solemn charge, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Matthew 26, 41. He witnessed again the scene in the judgment hall. It was torture to his bleeding heart to know that he had added the heaviest burden to the Savior's humiliation and grief. On the very spot where Jesus had poured out his soul in agony to his father, Peter fell upon his face and wished that he might die. Desire of Ages 7, 12, 7, 13. Okay, now what do you think about Peter? I mean, here he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's fallen down on the very place where Jesus had prayed. And he's just wishing that he could die. What an incredible experience. No wonder Peter was one of the two disciples, along with John, who raced to see if it was true that the tomb was empty on Sunday morning. What, who, what did, what did, how did they find out that the tomb was empty? The women told them. Yep. Yep. Well, here's a sort of a summary of some of what we've studied today uh, from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Let's just run through it quickly. During the ministry of Jesus, Peter often acted in the role of leader of the twelve disciples. That's one thing. He was their usual spokesman. When Matthew lists the disciples, he says, first, Peter. Matthew 10, 2. Peter also took a prominent role in the early church. It was Peter who took the initiative to appoint a disciple to replace Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, Acts 1, 15 to 25. On the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who explained to the multitudes that they were seeing the promised gift of the Spirit poured out by God upon his people, Acts 2, 14 to 36. And do you remember where that prophecy was made? Who said that that was going to happen, that the young men would, the, the old men? Yeah. Joel, that's in Joel, yeah. It was Peter who, when arrested for speaking about the resurrection of the dead, spoke to the high priest and the assembled Jewish leaders. And this is a, a passage, we just have to interrupt a second and look at this. Peter and John are arrested by the high, by the, basically by the Sanhedrin. And I'm going to read starting from Acts 4. Uh, and this is what Peter says. Look at Acts 4, starting with verse 11. Jesus is the one of whom the scripture says, the stone that you, the builders, despised, turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found through him alone. This is, this is the fisherman, the uneducated fisherman, speaking to the intelligentsia, the rulers of the nation of Israel, okay? Salvation is to be found through him alone. In all the world, there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. So they weren't supposed to be doing this, right? They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. What a change. What a change. Reading on, it was Peter who, when arrested for speaking about the resurrection of the dead, spoke to the high priest and the assembled Jewish leaders, same verses. It was Peter who was led to Cornelius, 
the first Gentile to be accepted as a follower of Jesus, Acts 10, 1 to 48. It was Peter whom Paul visited for 15 days when Paul first came to Jerusalem after his conversion, Galatians 1, 18. Indeed, describing the circle of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem at that time, Paul identifies three pillars of the church. Peter, James the brother of Jesus now, not James the disciple, but James the brother of Jesus, and John, the beloved disciple, Galatians 2, 9. So, think briefly about those in the couple minutes we have left. Remember the story of Cornelius. Peter was reluctant to go. He took some friends with him. They went up there and ministered to those people in the house of Cornelius, and the Holy Spirit came down on those Gentiles. And Peter, when he went back to Jerusalem, he said, I'm not the one who went in there and just decided on my own to be fellowshipping and eating with the Gentiles. God's Holy Spirit came down on them just as he came down on us. And what did the other disciples say? Well, the Holy Spirit did it. What can we say, right? We need to remember that in the early years of the church, virtually all the Christian believers were Jews. And there was still that real prejudice against Gentiles among the Jews. Peter, and I'm again quoting now, this is uh, Acts of the Apostles, one, page 198. Peter saw the error in which he had fallen and immediately set about repairing the evil he had, what, that had been wrought so far as was in his power. And this was the time he stopped eating with Gentiles in Antioch. God, who knows the end from the beginning, permitted Peter to reveal his weakness of character in order that the tried apostle might see that there was nothing in himself whereof he might boast. Even the best of men, if left to themselves, will err in judgment. God also saw that in time to come, some would be so deluded as to claim for Peter and his pretended successors the exalted prerogatives that belong to God alone. And this record of the apostle's weakness was to remain as a proof of his fallibility and the fact that he stood in no way above the level of the other apostles. Well, we know that Peter and Paul both died in Rome. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul, as a Roman citizen, had his head cut off. The two of them were probably imprisoned together in Mamertine prison before that happened. But we know now, in, this, in our next series of lessons, something about great Peter, our kind and loving father. Here's a gentleman who began as an uneducated fisherman, had no idea, I'm sure, in his childhood that he would end up the way he did. And yet, Jesus touched his life in, m in many ways, and he ended up being one of the greatest of the early church fathers. God blessed him, and he will have an eternity to enjoy his fellowship with Jesus and his other disciples and friends. And may we join that group ourselves as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>